Welcome back, History 1302, to another lecture here in class. And today, the topic that we'll be going over is what American society will look like in the 1950s. Now, we saw last week how America was beginning to transition from the Second World War to peace, but today we're going to focus how American society will begin to prosper by the time we get to the 1950s. Now, despite the fact that there were fears that America could enter another Great Depression following the Second World War, we'll see that Americans by the early 1950s would begin to adjust to this post-war climate. We'll see that jobs would be plentiful and the American economy will grow for the next 20 years, producing a large number of jobs that will pay much higher in wages than we've seen in previous periods. But let's talk about that growing economy that will contribute to this prosperity that we see in the United States. We'll see a number of industries are going to grow within the U.S., especially within the industrial sector. Now, the American industrial sector is going to have plenty of jobs, mainly because of the fallout of World War II. Now, with the conclusion of World War II, all of Europe is basically in shambles, and the main industrial producer for the world, as well as chemical producer, would become the United States. And since companies were generating large profits and they were growing, they could hire on more laborers, this would create more jobs, and this would contribute to prosperity. Not to mention, not only in these industries, and we'll talk about others as well, we'll see that workers that were going to work during this period, they're going to be paid almost double in wages compared to previous periods. And we'll talk about how that will impact the American standard of living during this period. But anyways, as we do see this economic growth for American, the American industrial sector, we'll also see that um, the American economy is going to grow in other fashions, mainly when we see the construction of the interstate system during this period. Now, during the 1950s, the main administration that will be in office would be that of Dwight Eisenhower. He had been elected in 1952, and many of the policies he's going to establish is going to help contribute to that growing American economy I mentioned a moment ago. But perhaps one of the most significant acts that he's going to pass during his administration that will contribute to economic growth would be that of the Federal Aid Highway Act. This was going to officially establish America's interstate systems. For those of us living here in Houston, you're probably familiar with I-10 as well as I-45. Well, they would be established as a part of this Federal Aid Highway Act. And the initial reason that we see the buildup of highway systems across the nation was not only to improve America's road system, but it was to better prepare the United States for defense. Remember, we see the ongoing Cold War during this period, and to respond to any potential Soviet threat, whether it be an invasion via Alaska or an attack out in uh, Europe, we'll see that the uh, under the Eisenhower administration, uh, the interstate system would serve that purpose of providing quick transportation for troops. However, as many of us probably know, the U.S. is never going to go off to war with the Soviet Union, and all these interstates that would be constructed will serve another purpose. You can travel on them, you could trade on them, and this will help bo boast the American economy. Not to mention, when we do see the construction of the interstate system, this is going to create what's known as the multiplier effect, which will ultimately contribute to not only the growing economy, but to growing American prosperity. Now, part of the uh, interstate system, with the buildup of, build of highways across the nation, we'll see that it's going to help stimulate the automobile industry, uh, industry, the oil industry, and so on and so forth. Because there was now a higher demand for both cars as well as oil, meaning with higher demand comes more uh, jobs that need to be filled. On top of that, you also see the construction of gas stations as well as movie theaters and restaurants along highways. And this will also help generate jobs that would further contribute to this prosperous society that we see beginning to develop. Now, many Americans, regardless of what industry they were going into, whether it was associated with the interstate system, whether it was associated with the industrial sector, we will see they will begin to enjoy larger wages than we've seen in previous periods. Now, as Americans were making more, and with the tax cuts that are associated with the Eisenhower administration, with more disposable income that we see, Americans are going to once again uh, indulge in a consumer society. Now, as we had seen in the 1920s, we'll see that there would be the development of a consumer society as well as consumer culture during the 1950s. Now, within the 1950s, we'll see that mass production, once again, is going to strike down prices on a number of products, make them much more affordable for people. And once again, Americans, especially when they're getting paid more and they're able to purchase some of these products, they're going to begin to indulge in them. Now, some of the things that would begin to be mass-produced during this period that will drastically transform American life would include things 
like the television. And with the rise of television, what we will see is it's going to greatly change how Americans view the home. We'll see Americans would begin to stay at home much more often during this period. On top of that, it's going to drastically transform how they receive news. And two, as we'll see a little bit later on, mainly in the 1960s, now that you have a television set within your home, and there will be about 90% of Americans who will own a television set, it will allow you to see news. And when we see images within the civil rights movement or within Vietnam, this is going to generate outrage over what's occurring within those episodes and transform how Americans respond to some of these issues. On top of that, what we'll also see mass produce that Americans are going to indulge in are going to be the development of what are called Levitt towns. Now, following World War II, what there will be is with a growing middle class, and I should have made that point earlier, we will see there will be a growing middle class in the U.S. With this growing middle class, there was developing a housing or a potential housing crisis. There wasn't enough houses for these individuals to move into. And to respond to this, what we'll see is America is going to begin to move to the suburbs, to where we'll see that mass production model would be applied to homes. And we see this first with Levittowns. Now, Levittowns would be established by William and Alfred Levitt, who would establish the first Levittown on Long Island in the uh, late 1940s. And what they're going to develop is houses that are very similar in layout, that are made of cheap material that you can quickly construct, that would prove to be relatively cheap and affordable for middle class and working class Americans. Well, when this first Levitt town opens up, we'll see that all the houses would sell out, over 40,000 uh, individuals would move in, and following that, we'll see Levitt towns would begin to pop up all across the nation, as well as other neighborhoods that were based off of this model. And we'll start to see that Americans will begin to move to the suburbs. And suburbia is going to come to represent this prosperous America that we see develop, this growing middle class, and recognize American notions of freedom during this period. However, while we do see Americans view this, uh, the 1950s, even up to today, as the golden age of prosperity, there are going to be some cracks that we see form within this prosperous America. And so let's take a look at some of those cracks that we see in this prosperous America. So even though America was witnessing its golden age, we will see that there will be some cracks within this prosperous society, mainly in regards to a couple of issues. First, we'll see that even though Americans were making more money by this period, and we also see that there was a growing middle class, a substantial number of Americans still fell below the poverty line. About one in five Americans were living in uh, poverty-stricken communities. That's about 20% of the nation. So that's one issue that we still see that really hasn't been addressed. On top of that, the issue of racial inequality was still prevalent across the nation. Remember the Jim Crow laws that we see within the South? They were still in place. Civil rights, while it was beginning to take shape, and we'll talk more about it here in a second, by the 1950s, it still hadn't really come to fruition. Not to mention, we also see that in, uh, southwestern, in the southwestern United States, as well as on the West Coast, Asian American groups, uh, as well as Hispanic American groups, were also being racially oppressed during this period as well. Now, there will be a group of uh, um, individuals who will emerge during this period known as the Beats who will begin to criticize much of what we see within American society. And these young individuals who back this movement, while they're beginning to form it and criticize some aspects of what we see with American society in the 1950s, we'll see that they will explode by the time we get to the 1960s and back the civil rights movement. But we'll talk about that next week. But in the meantime, since I did bring up civil rights, let's take a look at that movement because it does begin to develop within the 1950s and it will have profound impacts on the United States moving forward. So by the early 1950s, we do start to see the development of the modern civil rights movement that will begin to break down Jim Crow and eventually lead to racial equality. Now, the civil rights movement it really begins to take shape after the end of World War II, and we saw that there was some push for civil rights during the Truman administration. However, it's not going to be until the mid-1950s to when we do start to significantly see a pushing forth of this movement. Mainly when we start to see uh, segregation within the South be targeted, especially in regards to public schools as well as businesses and other institutions. Now, a big case that will emerge during this period that will help kickstart the modern day civil rights period is going to be that of Brown v. Board of Education. By the early 1950s, the issue of uh, segregation, not only within public schools, but also within colleges and universities, was becoming a major issue. And in this landmark decision made by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1954, we'll see that the U.S. Supreme Court would declare that all clause of separate but equal that had been established in Plessy v. Ferguson as unconstitutional, and call on uh, public schools across the nation to begin to racially integrate. 
Now, in the South, there's going to be a lot of pushback against this. And we'll see that uh, Southern uh, politicians are going to call on white Southerners to uh, begin massive resistance in the light of the Brown ruling. We'll see that lynchings would be on the rise, and this is where infamously we'll see the lynching of one 14-year-old named Emmett Till. And his lynching would galvanize a, a great portion of the American public. But anyways, even as we see this uh, occur, Southern politicians, they were determined to ensure that white Southerners would continue to resist. And we'll see that to back this policy, most Southern, Southern politicians would agree to what's called the Southern Manifesto. However, even in the light of this white backlash, we will continue to see movements being pushed forth to push forth this issue of civil rights. Because shortly after the Brown v. Board of Education ruling was delivered, we'll see that there would be another massive uh, or another massive movement against racial segregation in Montgomery, Alabama when we see the development of the Montgomery bus boycott. So the Montgomery bus boycott will begin in December of 1955, and this is where famously Rosa Parks is going to refuse to give up her seat in the third row on a Montgomery bus, um, in the Montgomery bus system. Now when she does this, inadvertently many historians will characterize her as beginning the modern day civil rights movement. The following day, we'll see that black leaders within uh, Montgomery, Alabama are going to agree to meet at a Baptist church, and the preacher of that Baptist church was one Martin Luther King Jr. And here, Martin Luther King Jr. is going to establish a precedent that will dominate the civil rights movement moving forward. He's going to call on the community to uh, uh, partake in what's known as nonviolent civil disobedience or nonviolent protest. They will call on a boycott of the Montgomery bus system. And the hope was that through this boycott, we'd start to see some of these segregationist laws begin to be broken down. Now, the boycott itself will last well over 381 days, and it will prove to be a success. We'll see that the Montgomery bus system would agree to begin to integrate. Now, those policies we'll see won't be universal across the board, but nonetheless, this was a major victory. On top of that, we'll also see with the success of the Montgomery bus boycott, over in Congress around the same time, we'll see that senators would be able to push forth a new Civil Rights Act, the first of its kind since the end of Reconstruction. Now, the Civil Rights Act of 1957, when it is passed, it's targeting uh, black voting rights that we see in the South. However, even though we do see a uh, Civil Rights Act, we'll see that it will be very loosely enforced in the South, and it would take further provisions to try to bring about racial equality. But in the light of the Civil Rights Act being passed by Congress, we'll see that the governor of Arkansas would be outraged by this call to uh, racially integrate uh, school districts. And we'll see he'll, in this episode, he would then shut down the Little Rock Central High School whenever it attempts to try to racially integrate. This is where you'll famously see the Little Rock Nine, and with it we'll see that there's almost virtually a riot that occurs within Arkansas, or a race riot that occurs in Little Rock, Arkansas. Now for the first time in, since Reconstruction, we will see federal troops would be called into this episode to suppress these riots. And this would only further uh, continue as we move into the late 1950s and the early 1960s. Now for the Civil Rights Movement, for the time being, we're going to put a hold on it because we'll see it really begins to slow following this episode, but by the beginning of the 1960s, we will see it will begin to pick up steam once again, and we'll talk about it in the 1960s. But in the meantime, as we see all this occurring back in the United States during the 1950s, we'll also see that America during the Eisenhower administration is going to have to be concerned with foreign issues because the Cold War was ongoing. And so now let's turn our attention to looking at foreign affairs and see how the Cold War was beginning to change as we get into the 1950s. Now by the time we get to the 1950s, the Cold War begins to change, especially as we get into the Eisenhower administration. Now, the Eisenhower administration, when he, uh, or well, when Eisenhower takes office, he promises the American people that not only will he end the Korean War, but also that he'd bring about genuine independence to the peoples of Europe, or uh, the pressed peoples of Europe. However, to try to implement this policy, it would prove to be a little more difficult than he initially conceived. And we'll see that he's going to have to resort to other issues to try to bring about genuine independence in some of these oppressed countries. Now, as we enter the 1950s, the Cold War and its dynamics are going to greatly change for two reasons. First, the Soviets had developed their own atomic bomb and they're on equal footing with the United States, and also China had fallen to communism. And on the world stage, militarily speaking, the U.S. could not confront both of those major communist powers. However, what the U.S. is going to begin to do by the early 1950s is begin to develop hydrogen bombs as well as other nuclear weapons to confront the Soviets on that front use the idea known as massive retaliation that if the Soviets or the Chinese aggressively expand, the U.S. would hit them with everything in their arsenal to try to stop and contain communism. 
and this policy will dominate much of the Eisenhower administration. We'll, we'll see that the threat of nuclear war will be a major deterrent, not only for the Soviets and the Chinese, but deter war for years to come during the Cold War. Now, also as he establishes this policy of massive retaliation, we'll also see that by the 1950s, the Cold War would begin to change as the U.S. is going to rely on a new organization to begin to upend unfriendly regimes and get involved in foreign affairs. This is where we'll see the Central Intelligence Agency, which had recently been founded just a few years prior to this, is going to begin to upend uh, several countries uh, that have unfriendly regimes, countries like Iran, Guatemala, and we'll also see that CIA agents would get involved in actions in Vietnam. And this is where America's involvement in Vietnam is going to begin. Now, it's not going to be a full-scale conflict for the Americans, but we will see that the U.S. would begin to dump funds into the French cause in Vietnam, and later, whenever we do see the South Vietnamese begin to fight against the North Vietnamese government. I'm not going to talk about the Vietnam War too much because I have a separate lecture in the future that will go over all these issues, but we do see that develop within the Eisenhower administration. On top of that, as we go deeper into the 1950s, we'll see that there will be a series of crises that Eisenhower will have to confront. We'll see that he would have to confront the ongoing um, Suez War that will begin in the late 1950s and actually condemn his allies with Great Britain, France, as well as Israel for attacking Egypt. And also we'll see he would have to deal with the Hungarian repression. Now, with those two events occurring overseas, we will see that he's going to have to deal with other major issues, most notably that the Cold War is going to take on a new dynamic by the time we get to 1957. By October of that year, the Soviets are going to successfully launch the first satellite in human history into Earth orbit. They're going to launch Sputnik, which will spark the space race. Now, Sputnik, as I mentioned a moment ago, will be the first man-made satellite to enter Earth orbit. Now, prior to this point, prior to the Soviets launching it, the American propaganda had basically said that the United States was light years ahead of the Soviets in regards of getting into, or potentially getting into space, in regards to their scientific achievements as well as their rocketry achievements. However, when Sputnik is the first device to enter space, we'll see that this will greatly humiliate Americans and the, uh, as well as the uh, propaganda machine that we had seen uh, promote this idea. And Americans started to realize that they were light years behind, in many cases they'll believe this, light years behind the Soviets. And quickly we'll see the Eisenhower administration is going to create a new organization, that of NASA, to try to catch up to the Soviets. And the U.S. will catch up to the Soviets and launch a satellite into orbit by the end of the 1950s. But we'll see this will effectively begin the space race as both countries, as they were engaging in an arm race, are now going to engage to see who can be the next country to uh, send a man into space and then the next country to land a man on the moon. But those issues will come to fruition by the time we get to the 1960s as well. But the last thing I do want to talk about the Cold War during the course of the Eisenhower administration, we will see that at the end of the 1950s, while he's going to have a failed U-2 summit with the um, Soviets, another pressing issue will be much closer to home for Eisenhower. Because just 70 miles off of the Florida Keys, the nation of Cuba is going to fall to communism. Now, when Cuba falls to communism under the regime of Fidel Castro, this brings the communist threat much closer to home. And we'll see that during the closing days of the Eisenhower administration, he would begin to form an operation to send into Cuba. Now, that operation won't come into fruition until we get to the Kennedy administration, but we will see that there were great concerns for Americans surrounding Cuba. And eventually, it will be in Cuba that we'll see the world will be on the verge of nuclear war. That will be discussed when we talk about the 1960s and the Kennedy administration next week. But anyways, we'll go ahead and we'll end on that note. And just like always, make sure that you complete all outstanding assignments, watch all videos, as well as read the textbook chapter in the uh, textbook. If you do have any questions in the meantime, feel free to reach out to me. But otherwise, everybody go out, be safe, and I'll see everybody in the next video.